We open the scriptures together this morning in the book of Proverbs, Proverbs 15. On the occasion of the baptism that we witnessed this morning, we'll be looking into God's word in Proverbs 15, verse 17, and a verse very similar, Proverbs 17, verse 1. Reading now, Proverbs 15. A soft answer turneth away wrath, but grievous words stir up anger. The tongue of the wise uses knowledge aright, but the mouth of fools poureth out foolishness. The eyes of the Lord are in every place, beholding the evil and the good. A wholesome tongue is a tree of life, but perverseness therein is a breach in the spirit. A fool despises his father's instruction, but he that regardeth reproof is prudent. In the house of the righteous is much treasure, but the revenues of the wicked, but in the revenues of the wicked is trouble. The lips of the wise disperse knowledge, but the heart of the foolish doeth not so. The sacrifice of the wicked is an abomination to the Lord, but the prayer of the upright is his delight. The way of the wicked is an abomination unto the Lord, but he loveth him that followeth after righteousness. Correction is grievous unto him that forsaketh the way, and he that hateth reproof shall die. Hell and destruction are before the Lord, How much more than the hearts of the children of men. A scorner loveth not one that reproveth him, neither will he go unto the wise. A merry heart maketh a cheerful countenance, but by sorrow of the heart the spirit is broken. The heart of him that hath understanding seeketh knowledge, but the mouth of fools findeth, feedeth on foolishness. All the days of the afflicted are evil, but he that is of a merry heart hath a continual feast. Better is a little with the fear of the Lord than great treasure and trouble therewith. Better is a dinner of herbs where love is than a stalled ox and hatred therewith. We're going to read to that point this morning, asking for God's blessing on the verses we read. And our text this morning, as I said, is first of all, verse 17. Better is a dinner of herbs where love is than a stalled ox and hatred therewith. And then also, 17, Proverbs 17, verse 1, which is not just a uh, copy but adds something significant. Better is a dry morsel and quietness. You could think of quietness as contentment, and contentment is found in love. So that's the fruit of love. Better is a dry morsel and quietness therewith than a house full of sacrifices with strife. Josh, may God in his abundant mercies, as he's promised those to us this morning in baptism, fill your house with the love of God and with quietness. To the blessing of yourself as parents and to the blessing of your children. And this is also our prayer for each one of us, each one of our homes, single dwellings, Each one of us, we pray that through the word of God that we hear this morning, we might abound in love and cast out hatred and strife in our homes. The Proverbs of Solomon are the words and wisdom of Jesus Christ. When we read Proverbs, we must hear in Jesus' words 
the greater than Solomon is here. Jesus himself tells us in the book of Proverbs that it is he that is speaking and we must not be thinking always of Solomon. That's Proverbs 8 verses 12 through 36 is where and that's where you should start reading the book of Proverbs. You should start first in chapter 8 at verse 12 and following where wisdom the wisdom in this book is personified, that is, speaks as a person. I, wisdom, dwell with prudence. And then in that, those verses in Proverbs 8, he identifies himself unmistakably who he is. Who is this one that is speaking of wisdom? He says, it is by me that kings rule today and judges pronounce their verdicts. He says, I am the one who will lead in righteousness. And then he says in those verses that I was with God when he created the world, when as yet there was none of the world. I stood by him when he made the, ever, the mountains. I was with him from everlasting, he said. And he says to us in those words, I was his delight. I stood with God in the beginning and he delighted in me. This is the second person of the Trinity, Jesus Christ, also now in flesh, because in Proverbs 8 he said, I came to be with the inhabitants of the earth. These are the words of Jesus Christ. And this is important, I make the point of that this morning, because Proverbs then are not simply the wisdom that one accu accumulates after many experiences and many struggles and morals, yes, that's true, but Proverbs are the truth that is revealed in Jesus Christ, who is the wisdom of God, and who says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And that means that these Proverbs are sure. They are reliable. They will re guide you in the way of the Lord. You may trust and follow and when we follow these by grace, be it sinfully, then we are under the Lord's own eyes. But it's important also to see these as Christ because then we see that it's his word. And his word empowers Christians. Not just words, but when he speaks to our hearts through these things, then it is Christ. It is Christ speaking and we must hear him today. And he says, walk in love. In your home, my love. And in its quietness. The two verses that we have chosen for baptism this morning is showing us the difference of a covenant home in this present world. This covenant home is of course built by God, Psalm 127, unless the Lord build the house, they labor in vain that build it. So it's a blessing of God, yes, but in a covenant home, God by grace gives us to know and confess the love of God, and we are called then in our covenant homes always to be growing in that love and to be reflecting his love. And so the text is speaking of a vital truth for the Christian home. Above all things, Colossians 3, 14, above all these things put on charity, put on love. That's what God is saying to us in your home. And in that way there will be quietness and contentment. Without this love of God, and not walking in this sacrificial love of God, there will be much heartache. There will be misery. There will be scars. There will be hurts. It will be because we are walking in hate and strife. And so the text tells us that we are standing now before God. And we must now answer to him for our own home. We must answer to him for our marriage. We must answer the question this morning, what is the condition of my home? 
Is there love? Is there peace? Do you want to be there? How do you live in your home? And it's speaking to all of us. It's speaking to the single. It's speaking to the young couple without children. It's speaking to a young family. It's talking to when us when our children are out of the house and it's just the two of us, grandchildren. It's calling us, not it, Christ. May he speak to our hearts. He's calling us daily to repentance, conversion, and to walk in his love. We I call your attention to the blessing of, a fam of family love and quietness. We notice that there are two homes being compared, that a call is being given, and that there's a possibility or there is the promise in Christ of this enjoyment. The text is contrasting two houses or homes, and more specifically it's contrasting what takes place in those homes. And then I would have you notice with me, first of all, under this first point, that the text is focusing on meal time, very obviously, at the supper table. The text is talking about two homes, perhaps on the same street, who are about to sit down for a dinner. In one of these homes, there will be grilled tenderloin of ox. There will be, the house will be for supper full of sacrifices, which can refer to sacrifices that were first brought to the temple and then they would enjoy them at home. Or you could translate those words, good cheer. The house is filled with good cheer, wine, wine glasses. And then in the other house, the supper is a weak soup. Perhaps just kale in the soup. There's a salad which has been made favor flavorable with herbs, basil and oregano. And there's a loaf of stale bread which passed its expiration date. But there is a peace for everyone in the home. And then the focus is shifting from what's on the table to what's in the heart of those who are around these tables. And around the steak and around the good cheer table is cold hate. They might not acknowledge that, but it's true. And strife. And children don't want to really be there. Their eyes are pensive. Like a scared dog. And there's cutting words at that table. And there's lots of hurt and anger and strife. But around that soup and that crust of bread in that table, in that home, there's warm love. There's happiness. They want to be there. And now before we go on to examine that more carefully, I want you to see with me, first of all, a step back a little bit, and I want you to see that God's Word is teaching us the priority of our mealtimes, of our family suppers, and of family worship at the supper. That's what God is saying. There's, must be a, there's a priority in the Word of God to family worship and gathering at a table regularly, every member of that family at the table. And why does the Holy Spirit focus on what goes on at that table in the home? And the answer is because that is the indication, that's the clearest indication of the life of the home. You go to a doctor. There's something wrong. You don't know what it is. The doctor doesn't follow you around all day and see how many push-ups you do, what you're eating, take your blood pressure at different times. No, he doesn't do that. 
he says, there has to be some blood work. And they draw a vial of blood. And from that blood, they can determine pretty much what's going on in your physical life. God draws from our tables and says, this pretty much determines what's going on in your family. And the attitude at that table. This is the scriptures. Psalm 128 speaks of the covenant family gathered about the table. This is the covenant, the Lord's Supper. How does the Lord express his fellowship with us? He expresses it in eating and drinking. This is the heart of the family. This is where worship, we are taught that we are to gather for food and worship. This must be the focus of our families. It must be mealtime. God is speaking. Do we have regular mealtimes? Regular. I understand that sometimes that can't happen. I'm, I know that. But is everyone present as an older couple with the children out and just the two of you, do you have meal times? Are teenagers there, despite their busy schedules? Is there the time that you are together around the table where you can worship, where you can talk, where you can help each other, put off the old man and put on the new man? Is it a, is it a time that the family needs and knows they need to be there. I know we're busy with work and now school and practices and sports and many, many things and meetings at church and we say there's no time. Beloved, we all know when we say those words, there's no time. We know when we say that, that we find the time for the things we enjoy. Suddenly, for the things we enjoy, soccer, volleyball, suddenly in those hours of the afternoon, which previously, too busy, when there are children and our grandchildren, we're there. Why are we there? Because it's dear. It's dear. Is this what is dear? This is what must be dear. Your supper time with everyone in your family. The text goes on to tell us, as I said, what's taking place at these two tables. And the contrast is, is very clear. There's hatred in one table. There's love in the other. There's quietness at one table. And that is not that the kids aren't speaking. There's a contentment. There's a satisfaction. I want to be here. At the other one, there's nothing but strife and cut downs and angry words. And so the question comes down to this. Which one do you want to be at? And which one is my table? And I know that it's not abs that there's extremes on both sides. But which one do we want to be? The one, as I said, is characterized by luxury. And as I speak now of luxury, you understand that there's nothing sinful about wealth and luxury. But the point is that in this home, this has become covetousness. This has become the thing to have. The table of the stalled ox and the table of the sacrifice picture a very beautiful and successful home. There's excellent gourmet meal being prepared. There's probably in every room and upstairs every conceivable gadget for, for the kids. They're given everything. There's, there's the ability to have all of these things, but the heart now has been shifted on these things. And because the heart 
has been shifted from God, the focus from God, everything at that meal table is spoiled. And it's not spoiled because there is botulism in, in the steak or something like that, but it's all spoiled because of what is in the heart and in the soul of the people around that table. That's the kind of poisoning. There's hate and there's strife. And it goes like this. The father comes home from work. And you can tell, maybe, that he had a bad day. And it's in his mood. And anything touches him off. And the kids have learned to give him wide berth. Well, there's tension between dad and mom. Dad is not satisfied with his wife. He's angry. He's, he doesn't meet, she doesn't meet his expectations. The wife responds, and she's very critical of her husband. And she says, he doesn't meet my needs. And there's no communication between the two of them, and there's a lot of fighting constantly, and the children can sense this. And the children now are beginning to follow the example of the parents. They yell, they scream, they're jealous, they fight, they compete. And sometimes they even say at the table, I hate you. And parents yell at the kids. On the outside, it seems to be okay. There's another explanation for the sacrifices in verse 1 of 17. Those sacrifices could refer to an outward observance of religious life. So there is the outward appearance of a religious life, but the heart of it somewhere is lost. I can't remember when it started but the gentleness, the meekness of Jesus Christ is no longer my focus. As I said, children cringe. Children resent their father. There's no patience. No patience in the family. Sometimes it's even said, get out of my sight. Get away from me. It's about ourselves. It's about our feelings. We don't want to be there. And the child doesn't want to be there. And maybe he came home and said, Mom, what's for supper? And she said, stalled ox, tender, best cut. And the son said, can I go by my friends for supper? They're having weak soup and stale bread. May I go by them? The other home is more meager. And again, there's nothing virtuous, there's nothing pious about poverty in itself. But this other home is more meager. It has one stall garage, a lot of stuff is worn, and there's not going to be roast beef and gravy this morning, this for lunch today. But the children are excited. And they really don't sense those things. Because they know the family is going to be there. Dad and mom are going to be there. Their brothers and sisters are going to be there. The love of God is there. That love there is not perfect. We'll talk more about that in a moment. But there's quietness in the house. There's contentment. There's a feeling of acceptance. Children feel that they have been accepted. Mom and dad show that they have accepted each other in Jesus Christ. Even if there's just herbs and stale crust, they want to be there. They can tell mom and dad all that happened to them in that day. And mom and dad want to know and mom tells her husband about all the things that happened to her. And the husband, even though he's been frantic and work all day, he knows he wants to listen to her because he is doing all of his work as a servant leader in his home, as, as her husband. There's laughter. There's talking. 
And it centers around the end of that meal, devotions. The Bible is present, not just as a book, not just as words, not just as something. we got to do a minute before we can run away, quick a minute. But to hear the words of wisdom in Jesus Christ, there's, according to the father and mother's ability, there's explanation. Good. There's questions. Do children have a Bible? Perhaps prayer is shared. Different ones lead or finish at the end of the, ma- of, the, of the meal. Or perhaps there's no children. It's just a couple. Or perhaps it's just you. But yet that word of God is there. The light of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And in the light of that gospel of Jesus Christ, respect and honor and thoughtfulness As I said earlier, at this meal table, practical truth is being taught. How to put off the old man. You interrupted your brother. Be satisfied for what you have. And how to put on the new man is being taught at that home, at that table. It's not perfect. They're sinful. They're sinful parents. There's words that are said that ought not to be said. And then there's apologies made later that night in the bedroom or in the family room to each other. But the hearts here have been broken. They have been broken by the love of God. They have been bowed before the cross of Christ. There is, in all of the weakness, there is a sense of care one for each other. And petty selfishness is crucified. Which one of these two homes is mine? That's the question that confronts this morning. Better, better is a dinner of herbs where love is than stalled ox where there is hatred. Better a crust of bread where there's quietness, then everything money could buy and strife. God is evaluating. And when he says better, he doesn't mean to say, well, both are acceptable, but he means to say one is good and the other is bad, but he uses the word better because that word better tells us despite what we might think Because our covetousness woos us. And having life on my terms, and my wife being who I want her to be, and having the things of this life, for each one of us, covetousness woos us. If I could be with my friends, they're so much better than than this family. If I could stop at the bar for fellowship, I much prefer that than going home to my family. Sin woos us, and so the Bible says, oh no. Better, better that you sit at a table where the love of God is and with contentment than you be in those other places. The text then does not mean, as I pointed out before, that wealth and prime rib and wine are sinful. The text does not say, as I said before, poverty is pious. But God is saying, riches don't make your home. Having you be you does not make your home. Poverty does not make your home impossible. Riches can't make you happy. Poverty can't take your happiness away. Happiness is satisfaction in the love of God and the acceptance that we feel when the love of God is present. Happiness is not dependent on how much you make. It's not going to be found in the salary that your husband makes. 
is not going to be found in a wife who has perfect skills and household skills and many other things who can do for you. Happiness is not found in the personalities of our children, the makeup of our children, if they were only different. No. Happiness is not taken away if God gives you handicapped children. Healthiness is, uh, happiness is not due to health in the home, or whether the kids are sick all the time, you think. Happiness is the love of God in Jesus Christ, which brings quietness and satisfaction. It's not what you eat today. It's not what we have. It's not what we lack today. Jesus Christ will make you whole. The most important thing is not what's on your table. The most important thing is fellowship with God at that table and with the others. And so God is obviously giving us a calling. Jesus is calling us. And that calling, Colossians 3, verse 14, above all things put on charity, love for charity. Love is the bond, it's fellowship of perfect, perfectness, of completeness, of quietness. Walk in love, Ephesians 5, verse 1, as the dear children of God. That means that we must know by God's grace, but know the love of God in our hearts as it's shown to us this morning in baptism, as it comes to us in the gospel. We must know that love of God. And as we heard last Sunday morning, knowing that love, we must reflect that love. Because when you know that love, we will want to show it. Now again, not perfectly, but we'll want to do that. And then we know that God's love is caused by himself. It's a grace to us. It's a wonder. I was thinking of that this past week that we live in Michigan, and as I'll just say it, when the weather is as nice as some of the days of the past week and all that we see in this, the water in Lake Michigan, it's beautiful. And God made it all because he's a God of wonder. God created it all in six days and he holds it in his hands because he's a great but the glory of God and his greatness is seen and that he loved me and that he loved you that he gave his son to die on the cross God commends his love, that is, God praises his own love. For what? For the creation? Yes. But he commends his love in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. And God has worked that love in our hearts by his grace. And we know that love of God. And we know that it is a sacrificial love. He gave himself that it's an unchangeable love. And we know that our calling, our privilege is to show that love of God. And we show that love of God not simply with sacrifices and outward customs and rituals, but we show that love of God from the heart and in our family. And that love of God does bring contentment. And it brings contentment in whatever situation that God is pleased. There are periods of trial, perhaps, and times when things are not going well and easy, or as they should, in our marriages, in our homes. And yet, that love of God brings quietness it brings satisfaction. It's covetousness that brings strife. 
God, God's love, satisfies us and brings peace even with difficulties, brings peace. But covetousness always brings strife. Covetousness is, what do I want? What about me? And it always brings strife. Young people, you must understand that. The lust of the flesh do not satisfy. They will never satisfy. Living for yourself, as is the motto of this world, doing every me is not going to satisfy. It just hollows out the soul and makes it more empty than what it was. Friends, do not satisfy you. God alone satisfies. We must hear that. We must hear that from the voice of Jesus. God satisfies. And in his love, there is peace and quietness. And so we have to clean our houses. We have to get rid of hate, and we have to call it what it is. Is there fighting and strife in your home? Then again, our theme chapter for this summer But now ye also put off all these anger, wrath, malice, blasphemy, cursing and swearing, evil communication, cut down sneers. Let these all be put away from you. Stubbornness, bitterness, unforgiveness, selfishness. The problem is my sin. Me. The problem is covetousness. Covetousness, again, doesn't mean, doesn't mean that things are the problem, but covetousness is the love of things. And covetousness is the great enemy to our Christian family today. And covetousness is when we put something, anything, any person, other than God and say that thing or person will make me happy. In our Colossians 3 passage, we learn that covetousness is idolatry. And so this is the way we can remember covetousness today. Covetousness is the sin of not being satisfied with God. Now just say that to yourself. Carl, you're not satisfied with God. You're complaining. You don't like this. You don't have to go through this. All these things, oh, it's all bad. You're not satisfied with God. It's not going to make, me, make us happy to go buy something. It's not going to make us happy to go do what we want. It's not going to be, make us happy to cast off these parents and cast off this wife and cast off this husband and do what I want and seek myself. And I'm, by seeking myself, I'm going to be happy. It's not going to come that way. It won't come that way. It can't come that way. God makes us happy. And that's what is behind covetousness. It's my pride. It's in the littlest child here. That's mine. It's in the teenager and preteens. My parents are bad. They don't love me. They don't give me what I want. I hate them. They don't let me do what other kids do. It's pride, it's selfishness, it leads to hate. And the trouble is our selfishness. My wife is not doing what I want. My husband is not being what I want. It would be better to get rid of them 
we do not accept the wisdom of God and what he gave me today and trust him. Then we're going to be focused on the love of God by obeying God's commandments. And we will follow the way of God's commandments because that will bring to us in the way of God's commandments God brings peace to our lives to our homes and so we we're, th we're through that I'll just I'll, I was going to say things but I'll just quote our theme passage and when you memorize scripture then you get time to meditate on them the whole summer long Husbands, love your wives and be not bitter against them. Wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands as it is fit in the Lord. We heard a wonderful sermon last Sunday night on, on submission. Children, obey your parents in all things. For this is well-pleasing to the Lord who loved you. Fathers, provoke not your children to anger. Don't exasperate them. Don't make them hopeless. Don't crush their spirit. Fathers, provoke not your children to anger. Lest they be discouraged. We must not make our home miserable with our disobedience to God. We must not point to others as the problem. We must have that mind of Christ put on therefore as the elect of God, holy and beloved, bowels of mercies, kindness, humbleness of mind, meekness, forbearing one another. Better is a dinner of herbs where love is than a stalled ox with hatred. Better is a dry morsel today with quietness than a house full of sacrifices and strife. Better. The blessing of God, walking in the love of God, living out of what was shown to us in baptism this morning. Our homes, not perfect, always with struggles. Nevertheless, that home becomes an oasis. You, you are thankful to God for what your parents provided for you in your home. When you finally get to 50 and 60, you say, I am so, I'm thankful. I sure criticized them a lot. I could list off their failures. I'm thankful. Because it was an oasis spiritually in this world. Children want to be there. Parents want to be there. Want to be there because of fellowship with God is there. It's a place where bruises are healed. Burdens are carried. Forgiveness is expressed. This morning we're standing before the word of Christ as he calls us to think about our homes, each one. God says, I want to see in every room of your house love, but at that family table. We see our faults. We sometimes despair. We believe that we have sinned too often, too long, too great, and too grievously. We might think there's too much damage now, too much hurt built up, too much strife over too many years. It can't be put together again. These are the words of Christ, and Christ does not lie. Christ does not, does not dangle out in front of me something which is beyond the reach of his grace. 
The word of God is sure. The word of God is powerful. Let us confess our faults in our homes. Let us reflect his love. Let us focus not on the fatted calf. Let us focus on what God has done for us and his love. Let us love one another and dwell in peace. God grant this. Amen. Father, as we come to Thee with, with acknowledgement of our failures and acknowledgement of the seriousness of sin, our sin, but we come to Thee, O Lord, in hope and in joy that in the sacrament of baptism Thou didst again testify, not some ceremony we made up, but the very word of Christ baptized them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, signifying the remission of sins and the promise of the Holy Spirit. May that Holy Spirit dwell abundantly in our hearts today in all humility before thee. And may the peace of God rule in our heart to the which we have been called in one body. And may we be thankful. Amen.